rest of the week. Joining me right now is Dr. Joseph Kuhn. He's a professor of biology at Case Western, and we're going to talk a little bit about the health of the lakes. Dr. Kuhns, thanks so much for joining me. Thank you for inviting me. Talk to me a little bit about Great Lakes Week right here in Cleveland, a very good location for it right here on, Great, on, on Lake Erie. Tell me a little bit about um, some highlighting some of the issues that, Great Lake, uh, that Lake Erie has had. Well, Lake Erie is um, among the, uh, the Great Lakes is in many ways the most sensitive lake in terms of uh, nutrient issues, um, fisheries issues, uh, a, a set of very interesting uh, management challenges that occur here. Why is that? Well, part of it is Lake Erie is a shallower lake than the other Great Lakes and therefore tends to be a little bit warmer, uh, has a more rapid water turnover rate, um, the amount of time it takes to flush uh, uh, the lake every year. Um, and then the, uh, the, the most interesting part of it is its shape. Uh, it has a very large central basin that is not all that deep and is uh, prone to develop um, anoxia, lack, lack of oxygen, in the late summer um, uh, of different years, um, which can have some profound implications for internal cycling of, of, of nutrients. And that's a very large area. Talk to me a little bit about the focus and the concentration that you have at Case Western. Um, well, I've been privileged to, uh, to be a, um, a member of the Science Advisory Board of the International Joint Commission over the past uh, two cycles, four years, uh, where I looked a lot at the, the nutrient issue, the reutrification issue that was developing in, in, in Lake Erie and in the, um, the nuisance algal growth, also the Cladophora growth in some of the other uh, uh, Great Lakes as well. And a lot of our work has been develop, devoted to trying to understand some of the, the, the factors behind it, plus the policy issues of how do you use the science to, to make decisions on target levels for phosphorus loading for the lake, for Okay, example. and so how do you? Um, it's, a, it's a complicated problem because the lake varies from year to year um, in terms of the overall levels of precipitation. 2011, when we met in Detroit, there were huge algae blooms that were occurring in the, in the, in the western the, part of the, the lake. Pictures, the pictures were amazing. And that was a year that we had nearly double the precipitation in the, in the region uh, compared to 2010 and to, to this year's, which has been a more normal year. So you have annual variability. That annual variability in weather terms is also influenced by climate, um, and therefore climate change issues become important. Um, the other parts of the problem that make it complicated are the fish. And the fish are a very large reservoir of phosphorus in the overall lake. And we manage the fish populations. The fish populations wax and wane. We may have new species coming in uh, that, that, that could influence it as well. So you have this very, very dynamical system with changes in, in weather, the amount of, of, of the warmth of the, of, the, of the lake, the depth of the, of the cold water uh, zone at the bottom of the lake. All of those things vary year by year and therefore the response of the lake to a nutrient loading episode is going to also vary. Is that also make it difficult to put a, a general baseline on, well, we need to get to this point and then we'll know, you know, we'll know what will happen next year, that because there is so much variance? Absolutely. One of the issues that with a, a target level of 11,000 metric tons, which we, we currently have and which will be in the, the next target for the, the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement, is that is that a, a, an upper limit or is that an average that we have to, to try to maintain? Will all of the, the problems go away if we just hold it at that, at that level? R remember that 11,000 metric tons was uh, a goal for phosphorus loading for Lake Erie way back in the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement. If we got there, we thought we'd fix everything. We got there and we had new problems. Not a, it wasn't everything was fixed. Now in the water quality agreement there are certain timelines now that have been put into place. Um, can you talk about those in terms of assessing things for three years and then and then five years? Um, the, there were always reporting cycles that were going to, to be used. Um, the, the issue is in terms of accountability and trying to, to achieve uh, the ends of the, of the agreement certainly have to have uh, periodic reporting but if we don't have the resources, the monitoring, to figure out how we end, 
we can strategically change nutrient loading from the different components to achieve an overall uh, effect of, uh, of reducing problems in the lake, it's, it's going to be any time frame is going to be, be hard to, to, to make work. So I think the real challenge in terms of implementation, and we were, you were just talking mm -hmm. with Joel about the, the issue of implementation, that's where everything is going to be. And the adaptive management framework that the agreement is, is now going to promote requires a lot of information to make adjustments in terms of how we are uh, using the, the resources of the lake. How do you think we've done over the last 10 years in dealing with the Great Lakes and the health of the Great Lakes? The, the Great Lakes restoration is a, is a major success story. And I think we can't lose sight of that. Uh, if you think back to where the lakes were at the, the initial signing of the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement in the early 1970s, things were really very bad. Mm -hmm. They've gotten a lot better, but it's against that background that things getting better that we notice the, the remaining problems even more. So I think the issue of, of addressing uh, and, and coordinating, uh, addressing uh, emerging problems, threats from invasive species, um, along with coordinating our management among these, this, all of the, the, the provincial, uh, state, federal agencies, and, and various partners, is a major, major challenge in terms of international joint management of a, of a, a resource like the Great Lakes. You talk about invasive species, obviously Asian carp, they get the biggest headlines. What other invasive species are we looking at possibly down the road beyond them? Well, the, the history of the Great Lakes is a history of invasive units. Um, the uh, numbers of invasive species is approaching 150, may have already exceeded that by mm -hmm. now. Um, there are the, the big actors, the Asian carp that everybody uh, is worrying about in terms of what could happen. Um, we've had the zebra mussel invasion that has radically transformed the ecosystems of the, uh, of the Great Lakes. And Besides those, we have things we don't know very much about, viruses that are invading the system. We are constantly under assault from invading species. So part of our strategy has to be, one, controlling vectors that the, the invasive species come in, but making sure we have healthy ecosystems that can resist the bad effects of these invasive species. I was going to say, because if you can't control how they're getting in, and I know that there's a lot of debate about uh, about separating Lake Michigan from the Mississippi River Basin, but if things do get in, like we've had the zebra mussel issue, then how do we adapt to um, to either trying to get rid of them or adapting the system right now so they don't they don't overrun the system? There, there would be a hope that we can make the system more resilient and, and, and healthier um, and therefore itself able to resist the, the invasive uh, species. But bear in mind, we are in an era of climate change. Um, the watersheds are changing, the temperature regimes are changing. Lake Erie was ice free last year. Um, so those are going to be continuing challenges for us to anticipate how the ecosystems are going to respond to these uh, threats that are, or, or changes. And I think you're use of the word ad adaptation is, is most appropriate in this context. We have to think about how we're going to adapt to this range of changes and still use these resources in a very sustainable manner for the future. Let's talk a little bit about Asian carp and the eDNA that was discovered in the Sandusky Bay and Sandusky River. Were you surprised by those findings? I was very surprised uh, by the findings. Um, the um, the, the use of, of these markers to help indicate uh, the presence of, uh, of fish or at least their, their DNA is a, is a very useful tool to begin to anticipate where we might be having problems long before we, we catch that first one mm -hmm. or the spawning uh, animals that are, that are running up the rivers. Does that necessarily mean there are Asian carp in Lake Erie? Because eDNA has been now called controversial, that you're not quite sure what it actually shows us or tells us. Well, that is true. I mean, it's a new technique. Mm -hmm. uh, it is an advanced warning that we have material that genetically resembles uh, Asian carp. Uh, we would be foolish to ignore it. Uh, it. It doesn't mean that we have a lot of fish that are reproducing right now right. In, the, in the lake. So, um, but it is a, another indication that we have to be vigilant. 
Dr. Coons, what do you hope to take out of this week and Great Lakes Week? What do you think that this conference or the convergence of all these groups should accomplish? Well, I, I am very encouraged by the, the, the Great Lakes Week programs in, in general to see the public groups and the public being involved, the chance to review for governments uh, the, the new features, for example, of the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement. I, I'm really interested in hearing a, a lot more about that, the, the kinds of implementation, the role that science is going to play in, in the new agreement. Uh, the way that citizen groups can use science and the way that we can communicate that with them. This is all very exciting. All right. Well, we hope you have a wonderful week. Thanks so much for joining us at Great Lakes Now. We appreciate it. Dr. Joseph Coons for joining us. Thank you. Enjoy the week. And you are watching live coverage of Great Lakes Week.